It is warm. All right, you guys. I do have a word for you. Just some things I want to share. I may not get too radical. We'll see. <laughs> because you know what? I'm going to say this. We have we we have kind of a, a dichotomy in being a Christian. And uh, what a dichotomy is for those of you who may be may not know what that means. It means two things that seem like they're opposite, and yet they they work together. And what I want to talk about is bold, boldness and humility. Now, sometimes uh, I think pride and arrogance gets mistaken for boldness, but sometimes boldness is called pride and arrogance, right? But I was just reading some stuff last night, just reading some things in the Gospels, and I was just thinking about, you know what God is looking for more than anything else, with his, especially with His people. I mean, He knows that the world's going to be the world. You know, you can't get... You know, Jesus said that we were fishers of men, so he, he looked at the loss as fish, as sim, you know, fish as a symbol. A fish is going to be a fish, right? And a fisherman's a fisherman. They're two different entities. You can't expect a fish to act like a fisherman, right? He's got to be born again. He's got to become a new creature. He's got to be completely transformed into something else. That's what, you, you know, you can't expect a goat to be a sheep, Right? Goats can't be sheep until they've been had a supernatural experience and they've been changed into a new creature. That's what being born again is about, right? So we can't expect that. But God does expect from His people two things. He expects us to be bold in sharing the gospel and sharing the truth of the Word of God and sharing what Jesus uh, has said and what the apostles have said and what all the prophets have said. He wants us to be bold and confident in our faith and not afraid of people and not afraid of what people will think and not afraid of, you know, what people will say or even what people might do in persecution. God doesn't want us to be afraid. He wants us to be bold and outspoken, but also with a heart of humility. Now, humility doesn't always come out of your mouth. It doesn't always sound like humility when you say certain things you have to say. But humility, and we're going to look at some of the things because... Here's what the Bible says. Everybody knows this scripture, right? In the book of James. Right? In the book of James, it says this. Well, no, 1 Peter, I think it says, well, it says it in 1 Peter 5, and it says it in James 2, but 1 Peter 5, God makes it very clear. God gives what? Grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. Now, let me give you a definition of pride. You want a definition of pride? A simple definition? Pride is thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Christians get into pride more than anything else between them and God by thinking that because God has said certain things in His Word that He owes us forgiveness or He owes us blessing or He owes us and we start getting in the attitude, well, God, You owe us so I don't have to keep a humble, broken, contrite heart that trembles and has the fear of God in it. And that's where we get we get our most problems when we get in pride. Now let me say this too. The world out there, they might the Bible might call them fish and it might call them goats. And it might call them heathen and it might even call them wicked and it might even call them evil. It's what the Bible calls them. But I'll tell you this much. God loves them and wants them to be saved. And he's given them an ability <laughs> to sniff out pride in a believer. Boy, they smell it <laughs> quick. And they don't like it. I'm telling you, they'll recognize arrogance and pride in a believer quicker than other believers will recognize it. And let me tell you, here's the thing. The pride that the Christians have to be careful of, and this one thing, and, and it's subtle, it gets in our hearts, it gets in our minds, but that because we're saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb, that somehow we're better than somebody out here that, that's not. And if that attitude it gets in there, well, I'm saved, I'm not like them. Instead of having the attitude of, you know what? I'm privileged and blessed. The only thing that makes me different is the mercy of God that opened my eyes because I was just like them. And even now, I struggle with the same things that they struggle with out there. So I'm no better. I just have Jesus. 
and I want them to have Jesus. And I don't want to come across as arrogant that I think I'm better. Amen? See, here's a good thing for Christians if we get this down in us. We're just beggars who found some bread. They hadn't found the bread yet. We're just trying to show them where the bread is. But we're all beggars because we all have sinned. We've all broken God's law. And we all deserve judgment and damnation in hell forever. That's what we deserve. Everybody. We've all uh, blasphemed God. We've broken. Listen, I can prove to you just about everybody's broken all the Ten Commandments. Almost. You've either done it outwardly or you've done it in your heart. Right? We could go down the list. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Oh boy. Has there been times we put other things in front of God? That's idolatry. You don't just have to bow down to a statue of Mary to commit idolatry. Right? Graven images. Boy, we've all had things in our houses that shouldn't be in our houses. Right? No graven images. Right? We could go down the list. Murder. Well, you know what? We may not have killed somebody. may not have had an abortion. But guess what? Have we hated your brother in your heart? You're a murderer. Right? Adultery. Well, maybe we hadn't cheated on a spouse before. Well, guess what? If we looked and continued looking and continued looking and continued looking at, at the opposite sex and lusting after them, then the Bible says Jesus said we've committed adultery in our heart, right? Thou shalt not covet, one of them. Uh, what is coveting? Desiring what somebody else has. And feeling upset that you don't have it. Oh, boy. A, a lot of people miss that one, don't they? That that's in the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt now bear false witness. Anybody ever told a lie on somebody else? <laughs> right? Which one am I missing here? For some reason, I feel like I'm missing one. Oh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, granted, we don't have to keep Saturday as a Sabbath anymore because Paul said in Colossians that we're not held to any particular day. But there should be a day that you set aside to worship God. You should go to church. You should worship God together with people. How many people don't care or seem to care about that anymore? You know what I mean? Church, even for Christians, it's amazing to me. I see it on Facebook and I, I hear it. people. It's church is optional, it seems. Well, I don't have to go to church to be saved. Really? True. You might can make it to heaven. I hate to see what God's going to say. I ask you why you hated his bride. Why you didn't want to hang out with the, with the bride of Christ. You know what I'm saying? I know there's some bad churches, but you know what? No excuse. Find some believers and hang out with them. Right? So we've all broken the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if we break God's law, then what, what do we deserve? Condemnation. Death. Punishment. Judgment. Hell. Forever. So everybody look at me. Just say this out loud. I deserve... I deserve... Eternal damnation. Eternal damnation. The only reason I'm not going to get that... The only reason I'm not going to get that... Because of what Jesus did... Because of what Jesus did... God opened my eyes... God opened my opened eyes... Opened my heart... Opened my heart... Drew me... Drew me... And He used somebody to do that... And He used somebody to do that... God used me... God used me... I'm just a beggar... That found bread... Trying to convince these other beggars that they need that bread of life... And if you keep that attitude... That you deserve it. That you deserve what they're going to get if they don't turn to Jesus. I mean, that is the fact. Jesus is the only salvation. The blood of Jesus is the only way to be forgiven of sin. You have to have faith in the blood of Jesus. You have to be willing to repent and turn from your sins and walk with God to the best of your ability to be saved. It's not automatic. It's not universalism. It's not universal salvation. It's not everybody's going to make it. There is a heaven. There is a hell. Some people are going to hell and some people are going to heaven. And Jesus said, narrow is the way and few there be that go into life, into heaven. And He said, but many there be that's going to go through the wide gate to destruction. But that is not the desire of God's heart. God said He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's heart, even though He's going to judge the wicked, and He's going to judge those who never turn to Jesus, and He's going to judge them for their sins and according to the law, that's not His desire. And so even within God, even though God is both bold and strong and perfect in judgment and perfect in justice, 
His desire in his heart, there's humility in his heart because even the most vile sinner out there that's cursing his name, that hates his guts, that, that defies God and mocks God. I'm having people mock God on my Facebook pages now more than ever. Just mock God. Right? And you know what? God looks at them and there's a side of him that's angry and says, you know what, boy? <laughs> you don't know who you're dealing with here. But then there's this other side of him as the father's heart that says, you know what, though? I want him. To, I want him to be saved. I want him to know my son, Jesus Christ. I want his sins to be washed away. I want him to know the joy of salvation. You know, I want him to know what I know. And I remember when I came to Jesus in 1987, when I really came back to the Lord wholeheartedly. What motivated me to share the gospel with people and to tell people about Jesus and to tell people what Jesus has done in my life and and even to go to to Israel and go to Mauritius and go to Africa and stand out in Monkey Park and, and preach and, and you know, pastor churches and start churches and all these things. It didn't have anything to do with wanting to be somebody. If I wanted to be somebody, I would have went to Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas and got a doctorate degree and be pastor in a megachurch somewhere. You can play your cards right in the religious world and have a cushy job. Okay. But what motivated me was I knew that people needed to know what I knew. People needed to find what I found. That I found true forgiveness, true repentance, a true relationship with Jesus, a true that, that I didn't, I was overwhelmed when I realized when God opened my eyes, I was overwhelmed at how blind I was. I mean, totally blind, deceived by the devil. Living in all kinds of sin and thinking I was God was okay with it. Deceived, completely deceived. And then the light came on. Jesus turned the light on. He used my boss that I worked with to do it. And the light came on and I saw my sin. I saw. See, you have, a lot of people think they're saved and they've never even realized they were lost. They've never realized they were a sinner. They never realized they needed to, listen, you, you can't convince somebody to take chemotherapy until you convince them they have cancer. And the church world has not convinced the, the, the unsaved that they've broken the law of God and that they're living and walking in death and that they need the, the, the remedy. They need the cure and the cure is Jesus, the blood of Jesus. They need to know Him and walk with Him. And I remember when my eyes were open to that and I, I realized that I was lost, I was deceived, I was blinded and I was on my way to hell for all eternity. That's when you get saved. And when you're, when, you, when you're broken down and you're humbled by God, and you realize, I'm a sinner. I deserve it. See, the moment we think we deserve heaven and we deserve eternal life and we deserve blessing and we deserve all this because we're a pretty good person, we've missed the whole point of the gospel. We're not listening to the Holy Spirit at all. Because the Holy Spirit is always going to try to bring humility and the fear of the Lord in our hearts to realize, I don't deserve God's forgiveness. I don't deserve His mercy. I don't deserve His that, that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I, he didn't do anything wrong. And yet He died and took my sin in His body on the tree for me. And I don't... So, so when all that became real to me, and I decided I'm turning from my sin and I'm giving Jesus my life the right way. When I did that, what, 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 when Jesus filled my heart with peace and with joy and the joy of salvation and the peace of God and the love of God and the Holy Spirit filled me, I, I couldn't help but tell people about it. I had to tell my best friends and my brother and my mom and my sister and, uh, People on the street, I had to tell them. I had to. Let me ask you something. Do you feel that? Do you feel that anymore? I mean, we're having a hard time getting these things passed out. And I'm just sitting here going, are you motivated? Are you motivated to reach somebody because of what God did in your life. See, there's a lot of people out here. They, uh, there's people that start ministries to reach people so that they can basically so that they can become successful. 
I mean, really, it's a business. They would never say it to you. But the ministry is a business. Getting a person in the ministry is the more they can get, the more they feel successful. And then that's why you know, you, you want to know when you know that a minister or a pastor or some minister of some evangelistic ministry, you want to know when you know it's just a business? Is when you see the issues of salvation like repentance and intimacy with God and uh, dealing with sin, dealing with... Uh, when you start seeing the compromise and the watering down, it's a business. Because the motivation to, to get someone out of sin and into a real relationship with Jesus has been lost somewhere. And I'm, I'm telling you, for a lot of Christians in ministry, it's a business. Or it's an ego thing. They really are not motivated anymore by the humility and by what, what motivates God. And so... I mean, there, there's, goodness, there's quite a few things. I want you to, oh gosh, I don't even know now. I, I'm just totally off my, my scriptures here. Just go, let's just look at it. Just go to, um, go to 1 Peter 5 so we can see it. Kind of a long introduction, huh? Woo. Y'all ready? First Peter five. Verse one. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And also the partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not because somebody forced you to, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money. Oh boy. <laughs> but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. I don't like these CEO pastors. Don't like them at all. Sorry. Their job is to be an example. If they sit in an office all day long and send send all their assistant pastors out to do everything, are they being examples to the flock? You get what I'm saying? There's plenty of ways to illustrate these things. Right? Let's keep going. He says, after he says, be an example to the flock, verse 4, he says, And when the chief shepherd, Jesus, shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and look at what he says here, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourselves, casting all your care upon him. And let me just say this. Keep reading here. He says, be sober. I'm going to show you something. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about whom, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now notice that he talks about humility here in the context of resisting the devil and being able to do warfare. Why? Jesus. Right. Because what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven? Pride. Pride. Do you think you can defeat the devil in your life if you get into pride? Remember pride, I wanted to remind you. For the Christian, the pride is a subtle thing. It creeps in. I am not like them. Or I know more than them. I'm more enlightened than them. I'm more knowledgeable than them. I'm more holy than them. I got news for you. I don't care how holy you are. You're not holy enough. 
Right? Because if you could be holy enough by yourself, then why do you need Jesus? Why do you need to walk in the light and the blood of Jesus to continually cleanse you if you are holy enough? So we everybody can say this. I'm not holy enough. I'm not holy enough. <laughs> so we need to quit worrying about and letting that creep in our heads. I'm better than someone else. Listen, go to Luke 18. You'll see it illustrated. Jesus illustrates it really well here. Luke 18. Lord, we thank you for this tree right here. It's wonderful. <laughs> but Luke 18, let's look at this. Y'all with me? Verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Oh boy. Come on out. I'm going to stop right here for a second. Jesus told a parable to the Pharisees who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. This is the most dangerous thing for a Christian to do. Is to begin to think, oh well, I'm righteous, and begin to look down and literally have disdain for unsaved lost people. Or somebody who's not living like you. Now, it doesn't mean we condone evil. I don't like homosexuality. It's evil. It's a sin. I don't like people who support abortion or, or, or push abortions. That's evil. It's darkness. You know what I'm saying? But I don't look at myself as better than them. I, I, I know something that's better. And I know someone who's better. And I know they need to know Him. And you know what? I know that I was like them. I know that their sin is damning them to hell. And my sin back in the day was damning me to hell. So we're still the same. I'm just for, I'm just down a different road, and I'm hoping they get on the road I get on. I'm hoping they find Jesus, but it's not out of I'm better. I'm not better because you know what? If I get the attitude that I'm better, that I'm superior, that I'm righteous, that because I'm righteous and know Jesus, that I can despise other people, then what's going to happen to me? The Bible says God begins to resist the proud, and pride goes before a fall. So what's going to happen to me? is that I'm going to be, actually in, in Obadiah, it says this, the pride of your heart has deceived you. So pride begins to deceive you. You'll go into deception. Then pride is always going to, to precede a fall. You're going to fall. And guess where you're going to be? Right doing stuff that's going to damn you to hell. And you're going to be in the same boat with that, with that unsaved person that you condemned. Or that you despised. That you thought you were better than. You understand? So Jesus, let's read it. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. So this is how the Pharisee, the righteous man, the man who was trying to be holy and godly and biblical and everything, this is how he prayed. Now listen to this, y'all. He said... God, so he ain't even talking to God doing it. God, I thank you that I am not as other men are. Oh boy, first mistake. Right. He says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this, even as this pathetic publican that's praying over here beside me. He even points out a guy. Right? <laughs> and he says, I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off, and listen to this, the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes in, unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself shall be brought down. Abased means brought down to the ground. And he that humbles himself will be exalted. The first place you have to humble yourself is before God. The second place is before your brothers and sisters. And the third place is before the world, even the unsaved. You know, I'm dealing right now. There's a guy that I became friends with on Facebook. He's a total heathen. 
unsaved, unbeliever, doesn't believe anything, foul mouth. I mean, he, 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 his, one of his pastimes is to go, he's in Ohio and up in the Philadelphia and he goes to New York and all this. He's an author. And he goes all over the place and he loves to find street preachers to mock and heckle. That's his, that's his fun. But he likes me. Now y'all know what I put on Facebook. I'm not, I'm not timid. But he likes me. You know why? Because one time I posted an article that said both the religious, that the religious right and the liberal left, they're both wrong. That got his attention. He read the whole thing and he was like, well, now here's a Christian that understands. Here's a Christian that's not just riding the conservative religious Republican right boat and understands that there's a bunch of evil people and evil ideas and evil practices even within the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Right? So that got his attention. So we had a conversation. So we became friends on Facebook. Now, guess what I have to do with him? He's had all the arrogant preachers, all the, the street preachers that he heckles and everything just go at him. But I'm real gentle with him. I'm real gentle with him. I give him a little bit at a time. And do you know something the other day? Now, here's an unbeliever. Wanted me to send him my books and promise he would read them. And now we're having a discussion about end time prophecy because he sees it happening. And I started discussing some things and he says, well, you know I don't believe this. He said the Antichrist stuff. He said, that's real interesting. I said, well, it's happening right now, man. And he was like, well, you know, I don't believe that. I said, well, it's going to be hard to miss because it's coming. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But here's a guy who heckled and mocked preachers. If I would have despised him. See, and he commented on my page going, are you going to be in New York sometime so I can come heckle and mock you? <laughs> That's how our conversation started. <laughs> right? And you know what I told him? I said, I'd love for you to come. You see what I'm saying? Just, I, I don't look at myself, his name's Dale, I don't look at myself as better than Dale. I actually feel kind of broken hearted for him. And I don't know his whole story, I don't know everything he's been through. But he's rough, man. He is rough around the edges. I think he was even in professional wrestling for a time and I mean, he, he, he writes about the old wrestlers and stuff. He writes books. He writes horrible, grotesque, horrible books and stuff. <laughs> he even said, well, I can't send you most of what I write, but I'll send you something. Send you something less offensive. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? I'm having a conversation now with a hardened, mocking, resisting, unbelieving lost person not because I backed away from what I believed or softened it or anything, but I was gentle with him. I was humble with him. He, he brought up one day, I, I said something about, we were talking and he said something about how completely opposite we were, that, you know, I was the good guy and he was the evil guy. And I said, no, I said, Dale, we're both evil. I said, we both have this, the desire to do horrible things are in both of us. I said, the only thing that makes me different from you is that I found Jesus and Jesus forgave me and washed that stuff away. But the desire is still there. I said, that's only, oh, I said, only his Holy Spirit in me holds, helps hold me back from doing everything you want, you talk about doing. I said, nothing makes me better than you. I just, I just have help and you need that help. And you know what? He received that. He listened to that. But if I'd have just went, you ugly, rotten, scoundrel, sinner man, you know, there's nothing, there's no hope for you. You see what I'm saying? Will we, will we still be having a conversation now about a year later? And the, and the Lord woke me up the other morning, and I got up real early, and, uh, and I was praying, and he came to mind. And what's wild, he came to mind, and I started praying for him, and it was that same evening that he started talking to me about end time prophecy he never has before. So, this is what I'm getting at. Humble. Luke 18. The publican just looked at himself as, Lord, be merciful to me. What is mercy? Somebody give me a definition of mercy. 
Not getting what you deserve. That's a good one. Not getting what you deserved. Right, here's, a, here's another one. I think uh, from the Strongs, it would be undeserved kindness and favor. Undeserved forgiveness. See, there's an interesting verse. Y'all want to look at a really interesting verse that if you don't really take it in this context, you will, it won't make sense to you. Go to Psalm 130. And I know that barbecue's starting to smell good, isn't it? <laughs> I love being out here. Do y'all like it? Psalm 130. Everybody there, I want you to see this one because this is a this is a verse that'll puzzle you unless you understand what I'm talking about. About keeping a humble, contrite heart toward the Lord, a heart that respects God, fears God, right? Because this is not the attitude of most of the church. Most of the church out here lives in fornication and adultery and pornography and hating people and despising people. They they, they go to these big churches. And then little churches and charismatic churches and Pentecostal churches and, and they think, you know what, I'm, I'm better than that person because they don't go to church, but they're living in sin too. And they think, well, you know, I just, because I go to church and I talk to God once a week and I'm forgiven and I, you know, they got all these ideas of how, what makes them righteous and what makes them right with God. And there's this little verse right here. We're going to read from verse one. But he says this, he says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But look at verse 4. It's the one I'm talking about. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. What? Wouldn't you think that forgiveness and the fear of God have no correlation if i'm forgiven if god forgives me then we're cool right no let me tell you here's the attitude because i it's i'm gonna tell you it's in me i stand in awe and tremble that god will forgive me not that god owes me or that god has to that just that's what blows me away is that God, when, whenever i got to use that credit card right there. So you either have an attitude that God owes you forgiveness and that it should be, it's just automatic. Or you tread lightly whenever you got to use that credit card. Because your heart's humble. And it's broken. And it understands I don't deserve this. I really deserve God's judgment and wrath when I sin. But I can come here and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. Help me to not do this. And he goes, there is forgiveness with you, Lord, that you may be feared. I mean, you got you got to look at it as the picture of this. You're guilty, right? You you smashed somebody's car with your car and then you fled the scene of the accident. But it was on videotape. <laughs> Along with your the tag of your car, right? Plain view. So you're guilty. You're busted. You you left the scene of an accident. Anybody know that's a serious problem? You're going to jail. <laughs> you're gonna pay some hefty fines, right? You are trembling. But you know you got to go and stand before a judge. You're going to have your day in court, right? And you're going to stand before a judge and you're trembling because you know what you deserve. But there's word out there that this judge sometimes just decides out of the blue. He just decides each case and he decides to have mercy once in a while. So you know that. But you know you deserve to go to jail. You deserve the... The, the fine and probably have your license yanked for a while whatever they do now 
you deserve it, but you see, you go in there and you go, well, I, I know this judge sometimes forgives, sometimes I don't know, but you go in there with a humble heart. If you Think about this. If you walked into that courtroom with your chest stuck out, you know what? I hear, Judge, that you forgive people when they do these things. You just need to forgive me because I'm a good guy. You say, what do you think Judge is going to do? Throw the book at you. He's going to look at you and go, wow. <laughs> you come up here thinking, I owe you something? But the person that comes in there and, and a head down and says, you know what? I know what I deserve, Judge. I, I deserve the fine. I deserve to go to jail. I deserve, I did wrong. I know I did wrong. I'm just, I'm, I'm praying you have mercy on me. See, there's a fear and a respect of that authority of that judge. And that's when true forgiveness can come. That's when the judge can go, you know what? This person is humble. This person is humble. I can give them grace. See, there's a lot of people out there thinking they're getting grace. They're not getting grace. God doesn't just give grace to anybody. This is what we got to get in our heads. It's not just some great, I said this in my book, grace is not some mystical force in the universe that God just rains down indiscriminately on everybody who thinks that they deserve it. No, grace is given to, did we just read it? Grace is given to the humble. Grace is not automatic. There's a lot of people thinking they're forgiven right now thinking that they're walking in grace and mercy. And guess what? Ha! Ah, sit. Faith Marie, sit on the blanket. Thank you. Did y'all, are y'all getting this? And, let me just show you this. If you understand this and you're, you know this and you're doing this in your life and you've checked yourself and you're making sure you're not being arrogant and prideful toward God. Remember the Pharisee, God, he's addressing God. He's not addressing anybody. God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. <laughs> Here's what I do. I'm righteous. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I, I fast. And God's looking at him going, you're not leaving here forgiven. You're not leaving here with grace. You're not leaving here justified, Mr. Holy Man, in your own eyes. <laughs> but the guy who said came in with his head down and said, wouldn't even lift his head up and said, be merciful to me. The word, be even using the word merciful means, I know I don't deserve this, but God, please forgive me. And Jesus said that man went down from there justified, having given grace. Boy, if we get anything out of this today, grace grace doesn't come because you visit a church. Grace doesn't come to you because you pay your tithes or, or, or fast twice in a week or even you even because you pray. Grace comes when you are humble and you are you're humble and you're broken about your sins and you don't look at yourself as better than other people. That you need God. You know you need God's mercy. And that you deserve judgment and wrath and you need mercy. And so you're not entering his courtroom arrogantly. But here's the good news. When you leave that courtroom forgiven and walking in humility, you can boldly share with other people that you found forgiveness through humility and repentance and that God is merciful if you're humble. If! I hear people talk about all the time, God's grace, mercy, but it's if. <laughs> if, 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 if you're humble. If you're willing to be obedient. If you're willing to admit you don't deserve it. You hadn't earned it, no matter how good you think you've been. Amen? Humility and boldness. You can have both. You can do both. Keep a humble heart toward God and toward other people. Be bold in proclaiming the truth. Being humble doesn't mean you're weak. You hear me? All right, let's pray. 
Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this church. I thank you for every person here. Those that didn't make it, we bless them. We pray over it. Lord, I pray as a pastor over everyone here, everyone that didn't make it, I pray for your, your touch, your hand to be upon them, your healing virtue to go to Bill and Susan and their foot issues and what's going on with them. Lord, we pray for your healing power to flow. We pray, God, for your truth. And that you will just bring this into us. Because, Lord, I know if our church is humble, Lord, that you will give us grace. And you won't resist us and we won't fall. But, Lord, I know you've given us the Holy Spirit not just to be quiet, but to be boldly. To boldly proclaim the Word of God to both the saved and the unsaved. So, Lord, help us have humility and boldness at the same time. And, God, we thank you that you're merciful, that you're patient, that you're loving, that you're kind but that you give grace to the humble, not just to anyone. Help us proclaim the gospel in the right way, and people will be saved. Lord, we pray it today in Jesus' name. Amen.